Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the International Myeloma Foundation's Foundation Regional Community Workshop Series. Today, we'll be presenting on several topics that are going to help you through the process that you're going through with your myeloma. Next slide, please. Today is our 139th workshop doing regional community workshops. Understand that that is two doctors at the workshop, which you'll be meeting here uh, in, in shortly, and one very special nurse from our nurse leadership board. So you can calculate that on your own time, but it's a lot. So I really appreciate you should come into the meeting. Now, one of the basics of our pillars of, uh, of our structure of our foundation is education. Now, over to the left, you see booklets. These booklets are incredibly helpful. Several of them are part of the understanding series. You'll see Velcade, RevelMed, BlendRev, uh, Xfeo, all of these type of medications that can help you through your process of, of uh, treatment. You'll also see some tip cards down there on the bottom. You might not know if you've just been diagnosed, what is myeloma? Well, that's when you come to our website, myeloma.org. We have uh, our website, we have the e-newsletter, the Myeloma Minute, IMF webinars, regional community workshops, and videos. You can get into our website and help yourself. It's a, it's a cornucopia of education that you can never get anywhere else. Next slide, please. Oh, and years have gone by that these have been our great sponsors. We're privileged at Amgen, GSK, Crystal Meyer Squibb, Janssen, Cario Farm, Takeda are sponsoring our workshops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your participation and support here is fantastic. Next slide. All right, now through the process after uh, uh, the Q&A with panel, there's a window, oh, you'll see a little box to ask questions and I would like you to ask them in the chat. So start firing off those questions if you don't know what a word means or something like that, or a topic or a statement, it goes right down to the bottom. Now, if you wanna send this out anonymously, please feel free to do so. I'm sorry to go there. And you can see where it says, welcome, type your question here. Very similar to anything you've worked on the internet with. Next slide. And there's a lag time in audio, nothing we can do about that. So basically the questions will come into me and I'll filter it to the speakers and they might not be as fast uh, to the next question because they're being filtered to me. But be patient, we're here to have fun today. Next slide. Oh, well, you're here and you're part of the virtual regional community workshop, Eastern Midwest. Our doctors are from the Midwest, great part of the country, and I'll introduce them shortly. You will be able, if you miss something in these slides, and not a lot of organizations do this, you can get the separate slides or you can get the video replay and slides. So you can go at your own speed. So just remember, after you go through this process, you have another opportunity to listen and follow up on this, plus other pre our previous RCWs, fantastic information. Next slide. All right, feedback, super, 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 super. I say that enough, super important. We need to know what you thought. We need to know if you liked it, you hated it, you didn't know, you, you just, Pick what you want for your topic, get it to me as soon as you can, and you'll notice that we uh, we listen to these, these topics and points and at times have adjusted our presentations. Next slide. Okay, 10 a.m., that's what we've already gone through. My name's Kelly Cox, I'm director, <clears throat> excuse me, support groups and senior director of regional community workshops. I visit about 38 support groups a year, plus put, well, now we've only been doing Zoom, but next year we'll be visiting and, and we do this and, and we do the uh, RCWs. I have two dear friends or three friends here that I'm very happy to say are on um, second to last RCW for 2023. Let's start out with Dr. Craig Cole, MD, Michigan State University, Caneros, Camareros Cancer Institute. Craig, how do I say that? Carmanos. Oh, Carmanos. Well, I butchered and, that. Oh, that was fine. Carmanos. Okay, that's good. See, I'm human. 1040, questions and answers with panel. 1055, we're, we're going to introduce you to uh, a part of our website called Meditation and Stretch Break. Then we got Relapse Therapy and Clinical Trials with Rafat Abinar, MD, 
uh, University of Indiana. Sorry. All right. And my slide got screwed up here. All right. And then the next one. Oh, I can't. I can't see it. And Deborah Doss. Okay. Why don't we just get started with Craig while I get this straightened out over here? Craig, take it over. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, and welcome to all the patients and family members that are out there. Um, and I'm going to talk about myeloma 101 and upfront therapy. Um, and that's me. So we'll talk about what myeloma is, how common it is, uh, the spectrum of plasma cell disorders, uh, the diagnosis, how we get there, some of the science behind the treatments, um, upfront uh, therapy strategies, bone support, of course, and then some of the new stuff. And some of the new stuff as uh, as of um, just um, August, um, where there has been a major change in upfront therapy for myeloma and then perspectives. So what is myeloma? Well, inside your bone marrow, there are plasma cells, and these plasma cells are part of the immune system, and they make antibodies, which are the proteins that stick to bacteria viruses in order to recognize and destroy them. So those plasma cells are in the marrow. However, if they get mutated, if they turn into cancer cells, we call those uh, plasma cells that are mutated and cancerous now myeloma cells um, or multiple myeloma cells. And those multiple myeloma cells will produce excessive amounts of protein, um, which we call the monoclonal protein. So myeloma is a blood cancer and it crowds out the normal functioning of the bone marrow, which is to make blood cells, which causes anemia. Also, those myeloma cells will go around to the surrounding bone and actually dissolve parts of the bone, forming lytic lesions or holes in the bone, which will make them weakened and easily damaged and broken. Also, when they're dissolving part of the bone, it'll release calcium into the bloodstream, which can then have people feel poorly. And that protein, those monoclonal proteins produced by those mutated uh, myeloma cells will get, can get stuck in the kidney. And when they get stuck in the kidney, which is the filter of the body, it can cause kidney damage um, and, um, and insufficiency of the kidneys. And a mnemonic that we use uh, for the signs and symptoms of myeloma is, are, is CRAB. C meaning high calcium, R meaning renal or kidney failure, A meaning anemia, and B uh, meaning bone destruction or how those myeloma cells can cause holes in the bones, which can cause pain. So a frequent uh, sign and symptom, you know, low blood counts because those plasma cells um, push out the normal uh, function of the bone marrow, happens in the over half of patients that have myeloma, causing fatigue um, and weakness. It can cause, again, that protein gets stuck in the kidney, causing kidney damage, which has people feeling weak because the, the uh, chemicals that the kidneys are supposed to remove can't be removed anymore, and they float around in the bloodstream. Um, it can cause bone damage in a lot of patients, um, and, um, and which can lead to fracture and pain. And then finally, because of that bone being dissolved, it can cause um, high calcium levels, which again causes weight loss, appetite loss, and again, fatigue. And again, that crab pneumonic, but 20, uh, 10 to 20% of patients won't have any symptoms at all. I just saw a patient that had no symptoms at all, um, who indeed had true and true multiple myeloma. Some of the fast facts, uh, myeloma is the second most common blood cancer behind lymphoma um, or lymph node cancer. 30, uh, almost 35,000 cases were diagnosed last year. And um, in last year, um, there are 138,451 people currently living with myeloma. And we'll re-explore that fact at the end of my talk. It is a, a, a diagnosis of, of adults. Um, myeloma is rarely, rarely ever seen in people under the age of 20. 
And, and it's interesting is that it has a significant disparity where people of African descent, not just African Americans, but people of African descent around the world have a higher incidence than people of European descent. Um, and why that is, we don't know, but an active area of research. And I'm trying to get it to advance. And it's not advancing. So the spectrum of plasma cell disorders, there's MGUS. Yeah, the only slide's not exhibited. There it goes, I hope. Um, look, keep hitting the buttons because um, I'm not getting it to advance. Um, MGUS is the pre... Um, yeah, just, oh, we'll just keep advancing it. Um, so MGUS is a precursor disease, very common condition. Um, about 5% of people over the age of 50 have MGUS. Um, and, um, and of course, that's when you have low amounts of protein in the blood and hardly any of those mutated plasma cells in the bone marrow. Smoldering myeloma is when you have more plasma cells in the bone marrow. The protein being produced is higher, but again, completely asymptomatic, a very low risk, 10% risk of progression to myeloma. And then there's high risk smoldering, where you have even more plasma cells in the bone marrow that's producing even more protein in the bloodstream. And those protein levels are going up and up and up, and people are becoming more and more anemic. That's high risk smoldering, where the chances of progression, progression in two years is over 50%. And then true and true multiple myeloma. Again, when patients have those crab symptoms that we talk about, or um, about seven years ago, we found that patients that have greater than more than 60% uh, plasma cells in the marrow, or if they're light chains, that protein being produced by the myeloma cells is very high, or if they have more than one uh, lytic lesion on a very sensitive scan, that they have a very high risk of developing symptomatic myeloma. So now we treat those people when they have the slim um, mnemonic high-risk features of multiple myeloma. The um, For patients that have MGUS, we watch them, smoldering um, observation on clinical trials. We think about treating those high-risk smoldering, those p patients that are evolving into myeloma. And of course, true and true myeloma, we uh, use upfront um, clinical trials or induction therapy. So it is really important to arm yourself with the knowledge of what the labs mean. A CBC um, will tell you what the red blood count is and what the other blood counts are. The comprehensive panel will look at that calcium. The creatinine is an assessment of kidney function. So we'll look at the kidney function, the comprehensive panel. and. Um, there are tests to help to look at bone disease also in a comprehensive panel. And those are the tests that are checked regularly, you know, every cycle of, of therapy in patients with myeloma. The beta-2 microglobulin and the LDH, the lactate dehydrogenase, are primarily used for staging um, the bright beta-2 microglobulin, are little hairs on the plasma cells uh, that can be picked up, which gives an idea of how many plasma cells there are. And the LDH, um, when the cells are dividing quickly, it will release that chemical in the blood. So it gives you an idea about the biology. But to tell you how much myeloma there is at any particular time, we look at that protein that I talked about earlier using the SPEP, um, which detects the amount of intact um, uh, protein produced by the myeloma cell. So how much myeloma cell, uh, how much myeloma is there? The immunofixation, which tells you the type. There's IgG, IgA, kappa, or lambda. That's the immunofixation tells you the type, while the SPEP tells you how much. The, the serum-free light chain assay, which looks at those little fragments of protein being produced by the myeloma cells. Again, tells you how much myeloma there is. And the free light chain has basically completely replaced doing the urine test. Um, I think some of the patients that have had myeloma uh, 10 years ago can attest to how we used to test, how we used to check 24-hour urines to see how much myeloma there was, that Bench Jones protein. But the big three to tell you how much myeloma you have is the SPEP, the immunofixation, and the serum-free light chain assay. So again, when you... Um, you divide the protein in the blood 
out by its components, it'll make a graph similar to what's on the screen right now. If you have myeloma, then you have a tall church spire peak. And if you take the area under the curve of that, speak, that, of that peak, that tells you what the M protein is or how many myeloma cells there are. And that um, will basically give an idea of how much myeloma is inside the bone marrow. Because we don't want to do bone marrows every month and, every, and, and everybody. So we can get a surrogate to that by checking that protein being produced by those myeloma cells. And the good news is, is that if you treat and you get rid of the myeloma, the myeloma burden goes down, you can see that protein going down. So it's really important to know how much protein you have um, in order to know when to celebrate when your treatment has worked. The other test, again, is a free light chain. So about 12% of patients with myeloma will only produce the light chains. So right now, every um, um, for me, for instance, have equal amounts of that kappa and lambda protein being produced by the small number of plasma cells that are inside my bone marrow. And the ratio between those two should be one. However, if someone has myeloma, they'll have lots of kappa or lambda light chain in their bloodstream. And the other protein will be suppressed. And when you treat, and the ratio will be greater, it will be uh, more than 100. And again, when you treat the myeloma, the kappa protein goes down to normal, the lambda protein returns to normal, so it looks just like everybody else. The ratio has returned to normal, and then you celebrate because you know the treatment has worked. Again, um, most patients, about 80% of patients will have an IgG kappa or lambda or an IgA kappa or lambda. Rarely patients will have an IgM kappa or lambda multiple myeloma. About uh, 18, about 20% of patients will have only light chain. So their plasma cells will only produce fragments of that antibody in the bloodstream. And we use the free light chain to measure that. And then rarely there are patients will have non-secretory or agglial secretory secretory myeloma, where the myeloma has enough mutations in it that it doesn't know how, doesn't remember how to produce any antibody at all. So how we reach the diagnosis is that we get x-rays looking um, at the bones to see if there are those punched out lytic lesions. Um, this is a patient of mine from a few years ago, and you can see in her skull that she has lots of those lytic lesions where the myeloma has dissolved part of the bone. Um, the PET scan is a much better way. It really has replaced the skeletal x-rays as the initial test we look for in multiple myeloma because it's much more sensitive and it shows up these bright white spots um, where the myeloma cells are in the body that the x-rays may not be able to pick up. And then we confirm the diagnosis by doing a bone marrow biopsy, looking for more than 10% of plasma cells in those marrow, in the marrow. And if you have the crab that we talked about or that slim crab that we talked about, then that makes the diagnosis of myeloma. The um, once we do that bone marrow, the question is, is what mutations cause the myeloma to come up in the first place? And a way to do that is to look at those mutated plasma cells, see what corruption happened in the in the DNA. And the main test that we use is the FISH, the fluorescent in situ hybridization test that can identify the abnormal chromosomes that again it's not the chromosomes that you that that is hereditary it's the mutations that only occurred in those plasma cells only in your bone marrow um, that can be detected on a bone marrow biopsy and you can stain those abnormal chromosomes with the fish stain um, they're more and more we're using plasma cell uh, next generation sequencing to look at the various genes that not just the chromosomes, but the genes that are mutated in multiple myeloma. And once we have the information about the cytogen, about the fish side genetics, we can then classify patients as standard risk side genetics or high risk. High risk cytogenetics, the deletion of the 17th chromosome, gains of the first chromosome or translocations of uh, with the 14th chromosome. Um, are more difficult to treat. Um, it's harder to keep those patients in a remission, so we call that high risk. All the other uh, findings that we have in the bone marrow, where there's more than one copy of the chromosome, so there, instead of two 
copies of chromosome number five. There are three copies of chromosome number five trisomies or translocation of the 11th uh, and 14th chromosome or the 6th and 14th chromosome. Uh, those are standard risks. So it's, it's easier to keep those patients in responses uh, as opposed to the high risk patients. And using all that information that I talked about, we can then stage patients with myeloma. It's important to know the stage of myeloma because it gives an idea of, of how easy or how difficult it is to keep someone in a remission. Stage one is when there are low amounts of that little hairs on the on the plasma cells, the beta trimethoglobulin, and the other tests that lactate dehydrogenase is normal. Normal. Um, stage three is when there's lots of those little hairs in the bloodstream from the myeloma cells. There's lots of, of, of lactate dehydrogenase, so cells are dividing quickly in high risk cytogenetics. And stage two is in between, um, that it doesn't fit neither stage one nor stage three. And what we do with that information is that we plan, make a treatment plan. So how do we treat myeloma in 2022? We use science to treat myeloma. We only use a little bit of chemotherapy, but we use a whole lot of science to treat myeloma. Those immunomodulatory drugs that we'll talk about, including Revlimid, um, the proteasome inhibitors, including Valcade and, and Kyprolis, and then the antibodies against myeloma, like uh, Dara, Fastpro, Darzalex, Sarclisa, and Implicity. Um, and there's so many new drugs that are coming out for relapse refractory myeloma, and Dr. Abner will talk about that in a bit. So again, how does Revlimid work? How, how do these drugs work? Well, they again, they use science. The Revlimid, the IMID drugs, Revlimid, Pomelis, and Thalidomide, inhibit DNA synthesis to a very small degree, little bit. But what are, and they were originally designed to inhibit blood vessel formation by getting rid of a, of a, a cytokine chemical called vascular nuclear growth factor, or VEGF. And the idea is if you starve those myeloma cells of the blood vessels inside the bone marrow, that there will be no nutrient supply to them and that would starve them to death. But what these drugs really do is that the myeloma cells are dependent exquisitely on those bone marrow stromal cells. The reason that you don't see myeloma in the brain or in the lung is that it has to be attached to those stromal cells that you find in the bones and in the bone marrow. If you break that connection between the myeloma cell and the bone marrow stromal cell, the myeloma cells starve through that. They can't live without those uh, bone marrow stromal cells. Also, it, it starves them of the cytokines, the chemicals that they need to grow and proliferate and be resistant to therapy, including interleukin-6, starves them of the food that they need. And probably most important, and very exciting is that it gets the patient's own T cells to attack the myeloma. So prior to using these drugs, the T cells ignored the myeloma. And then you use Revlimid, thalidomide, and pomelis. Those T cells will attack the myeloma cells and your own immune system kills the cells, which is just, I still think after 20 years of Revlimid, I think it is incredible. So again, these drugs are initially uh, synthesized from thalidomide. Uh, Revlimid was approved in 2006, and then in 2013, pomalidomide was approved for relapse refractory uh, myeloma. And then their new um, imids, including iberitamide, and then the cell mod drugs, which are the, the ultra synthetic versions of these drugs that are currently in clinical trials. Very exciting. So pomalist, um, um, uh, uh, pomalidomide, uh, I'm sorry, Velcade, uh, Kyprolis, and um, Nenlaro, how do those drugs work? Well, they inhibit the proteasome. So what's a proteasome? There are these little tiny organelles inside the, inside the plasma cell, and myeloma cells have lots of proteasomes inside of it. The reason they have lots of proteasomes is that myeloma cells, what do they do? They produce a lot of protein. They produce that, myel the, that monoclonal protein. And when those proteins are being produced by the my myeloma cell, they're actually uh, uh, dissolved and excreted through the proteasome. So that's how the myeloma cells get rid of their waste is by using the proteasome. But if you're a myeloma cell and you inhibit the proteasome, and myeloma cells produce all that protein, 
those like putting a cork in the exhaust pipe of the cell. Those proteins build up and build up and build up, and it uses the factory of the myeloma cell against it by inhibiting the proteasome, and the myeloma cells pop with from within. So it kills the myeloma cell by turning that protein generation against it. Um, again, Velcade was the first I mean, class, came out around the same time as Ravomid did, and FDA approved in 2003, um, and is now one of our main, it is our, one of our main therapies of upfront myeloma. Um, Carprolis then came out as an irreversible proteasome inhibitor. It's like pouring cement in the, in the gas tank of the, uh, the exhaust pipe of the myeloma cell. Um, and then subsequently, uh, the oral version of Velcade came out, and Laro, um, and it was approved in 2015. What has been revolutionary in myeloma is the is the immune therapies. So each cell in your body, including myeloma cells, has an address on top of it. The SLAM7, uh, GPRC5, CD38, and BCMA are all, all proteins that are on myeloma cells that identify the myeloma cell as a myeloma cell and not an eyeball cell. So those proteins that are on myeloma cells that help identify it, there have been, pro there have been uh, uh, proteins made in the laboratory against that. There have been antibodies made it, because remember we talked about how how antibodies attack attach to um, uh, viruses and bacteria, which helps the body recognize to kill them. And so when these um, antibodies um, stick to the myeloma cell, um, elotuzumab, which is against uh, SLAM7, uh, daratumumab and Darzlux FASPRO, which are in isotuximab against CD38, or those incredible new therapies that are directed towards BCMA, they help to identify and destroy the myeloma cell, um, which has been very exciting. So how do these drugs work? Well, again, those, those surface proteins like CD38 on those myeloma cells, and when you use these, these drugs like isotuximab or daratumumab or elotuzumab, those antibodies stick to the myeloma cell and get the immune system to identify it. And then the, the uh, killer cells destroy the myeloma cell, thinking that it's some type of infection. They also get cytotoxic, cytotoxic macrophages, which go to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with the myeloma cell to kill it. Also, complement is an ancient part of our immune system. And anytime an antibody attaches to something, complement gets involved and it bores holes inside the myeloma cell, having a bleed to death, also by attaching to the those protein, uh, um, those um, surface proteins, it short circuits the myeloma cell killing it. And again, we talked about how important that adhesion to the uh, to the bone marrow stromal cells to keep the myeloma cells alive. When those antibodies attach to it, then the bone marrow stromal cells kick the myeloma cells out, and again they die. A multimodal mechanism of action of those um, monoclonal antibodies against myeloma. So here are the tools of the trade that we use for myeloma. Again, sometimes we do use chemotherapy. Frequently we use chemotherapy, especially with transplant. I'll talk about in a bit. We still use steroids and again, those science drugs that I talked about, which has really opened up the treatment sequence and look at all the different therapies. Um, when, when Dr. Abenauer and I, I were first doing this, this list was much, much shorter. It has gotten much longer because so much more science and clinical trials have given us so many more fantastic options. So for newly diagnosed uh, patients, we divide them between transplant candidates and non-transplant candidates. Again, if you have high-risk myeloma, um, it is more difficult to keep in remission. We'll use RVD or sometimes we'll use the quad, uh, we'll use DERA, Revlimid index, the antibodies and those imid drugs together. For standard risk patients, again, very similar to RVD um, or DARA RD. And if you're a transplant candidate, um, for high risk patients, we definitely use the, the quad, the DARA RVD, followed by early transplant. And for standard risk patients, again, I'll talk about how we're really leaning towards using the four drug induction therapy, the DARA RVD, followed by transplant or delayed transplant. But the preferred is to go to transplant, and I'll show you why. 
Um, when we look at, I love talking about the iceberg model with my patients, about how when patients first come in with myeloma, that is obvious that they have myeloma. They have broken bones, they have anemia, they're not feeling well. They have trillions of myeloma cells. But as we begin the treatment, the goal of the therapy is to reduce down the number of plasma cells. And when you have a 50% reduction in your M protein, we call that a partial response, a 90% reduction in your protein, we call that a very good partial response. And when there's zero protein, then we call that a complete response or sometimes a complete remission to drive the disease down well below the waves. And the deeper we drive those responses, the longer it will take to grow back to, to go back up. So how do we drive the disease down deeply is we uh, use stem cell transplant in addition to those science therapies. And I like to think of it as the left hook that I don't know much about boxing, I'll be honest, but to the RVD is like that right hook, right hook. You got the bad, you got the myeloma cell kind of wavering on a sneeze. And if you don't knock them out, you hit him with something he's not expecting, the chemotherapy of a stem cell transplant. And just recently um, in July, a paper came out where they where they got patients with newly diagnosed myeloma and then divided them into two groups, either RVD with um, without transplant, so RVD, um, for two or three cycles, they collected their stem cells and then continued them in RVD followed by rev maintenance, or they had RVD that we've talked about before, the three drug regimen, stem cell transplant followed by consolidation and maintenance. So transplant versus no transplant for patients with multiple myeloma to see, well, do we need to do transplant? And this is how it ended up. Definitely transplant versus no transplant, that extra dose of chemotherapy, that, that that left hook of chemotherapy, there were more blood problems, that people were more anemic, they had more nausea. All that happens in the hospital um, where, um, um, where it's controllable. So yes, for, for toxicity, transplant wins. However, the time to relapse, the progression-free survival was longer when pa the patients that got transplant, and that was significant, especially for those high-risk patients. If you have high-risk myeloma, transplant definitely gave you a benefit in time uh, to, to relapse as compared to RVD alone. Overall survival, though, was the same. So overall survival so far is the same between, but patients were able to stay in their emissions longer when they had transplant. Those uh, deeper responses, again, better, that deeper on the, um, on the iceberg, better with transplant. And MRD negativity, where you can't even detect on a molecular basis any signs of disease, again, transplant wins that fight too. So for depth of response, uh, transplant wins. And at a follow-up of 76 months, the risk of progression was higher with RVD alone as compared with the transplant, and that was significant. Patients have asked me, you know, what happens to my quality of life if I go through a transplant? The blue line um, and for global health status, so the quality of life and physical functioning, the blue line is no transplant, the red line is transplant. And there is a brief dip in the quality of life and physical functioning as you recover from the transplant. But you see, you return right back to where you were um, a few months uh, after the transplant. And the benefit is that you stay in your remissions longer. So the quality of life returns the same, if not a bit better after transplant. What to do after transplant? Well, a study that randomized patients between after transplant going directly to rev maintenance versus consolidation, which was a second transplant, uh, followed by rev maintenance. That study showed that it didn't matter um, if you had a second transplant, consolidation, or straight to rev maintenance. So usually what we do post-transplant is have patients go directly to rev, the, to maintenance revlimid. And there have been over 2,000 patients on clinical trials showing that there is a benefit in progression-free survival and a modest improvement in overall survival by maintenance therapy. So how long should people be in maintenance therapy? Therapy is an active area of investigation, but maintenance therapy um, really is a standard of care to, again, once you got the bad guy knocked out, once you've knocked him out and he's down on the mat, 
the maintenance therapy is like putting your foot on the bad guy so he doesn't get back up for a long time. The um, I can't emphasize how important it is for bone support. We want to heal those bones. Once you got the myeloma under control, we want those bones to heal and be strong so you can go out and go biking and go fishing um, without having pain. And the way to make those bones strong is that we use the bone strengthening drugs. Uh, drugs. Pimidronate or Exgeva helps to strengthen the bones and usually given on a monthly basis for two years um, after we start therapy. Vitamin D and calcium uh, supplements are extremely important in helping to heal the bones. And for those patients having pain, things like orthopedic support, um, talking to our physical therapists, our physical medicine doctors and our orthopedic surgeons, and sometimes radiation doctors to help strengthen the bones decrease pain um, so patients can again have their normal functioning and then briefly i want to talk about one of the newest things and really some uh, study that has really changed um, the standard of care of myeloma in the united states which is the griffin trial so the griffin trial um, had transplant eligible pay and this was um, um, announced at the international Maya, uh, the international uh, myeloma society uh, meeting um, just in August of 2022. The final results of it were announced then. And they got patients um, and um, um, they were newly diagnosed and they were randomized between the current standard of care, RVD, super good therapy. That's why we shouldn't worry about randomization because patients are randomized to the best available therapy or they were randomized to daratumumab, Revlimid, Velcade, and Dexamethasone. So either Dara RVD or RVD, both very good therapies. The everyone underwent stem cell transplant, followed by Dara RVD or RVD consolidation, followed by maintenance. And the question is, did adding the daratumumab to the standard of care help at all? Well, what it did was that at the end of consolidation, you can see the response rates were incredible. 99% response rate for the DARA RVD. Those deep responses are in orange and in green where they're in stringent complete responses and very good partial responses higher in the DARA uh, group than in the RVD alone group, which is a bit of a surprise. But you look at the end of the study, at the end of the study, look how those responses are even deeper. So after those patients have been on maintenance, Post transplant with Dara RVD or or or, or Revel or Dara Revdex uh, versus Rev um, alone. I'm sorry, Dara Rev or 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 Rev alone. Those responses got even deeper, even deeper responses through time, and so that really led to this being the new standard of care. The final analysis after four years of follow-up of DARA RVD versus RVD alone, again, a reduction in progression primarily um, by, with the addition of daratumumab, which really makes it the new, I think, standard of care in myeloma. And I think that's where we're going. There's so many trials showing incredible response rate with the addition of the immune therapies added to the standard therapy. It really has uh, been quite incredible. Incredible. So it's important to know your goals of therapy. Not everyone wants a, the deepest response possible. Um, so it's important to talk to your doctor about what do you want to do. Also, know how to read your M protein level. You don't want bone marrow biopsies every month, I'm sure. And you want to know how high is your protein, you know how much myeloma you have, so you know when to celebrate. When that therapy works and that protein goes down, it's good to know so you can celebrate. Know your risk and stage. Know, I showed you all those treatment options um, that are available. So know that. Know what your response is, again, so you can celebrate. Know the side effects. Know who to report them to. Know who's on the team. So it's not being, you're not boxing in a ring with myeloma by yourself. Know who your team is. And I would recommend us uh, to get second opinions and always ask about clinical trials. My favorite slide is that um, over the years, 
if you can advance, uh, there we are. Over the years, with all these new biologic therapies, the response rates are now over 98%. Um, we've had 31 drugs approved since 2015, uh, regimens and drugs approved since 2013. And myeloma survival has increased significantly. You look at the graph, back in 2004, there were only 54,000 patients living with myeloma in the United States. Now there's 138,451 patients. That's not because the incidence is climbing that rapidly, it's because people are surviving this disease. And myeloma is not curable yet, but it is survivable now. And next slide. Thank you. So there's our new hospital and our, our labs. Great job, Craig. <laughs> Excuse me, you know, this has garnered a couple of questions, but where is the new lab? Is that the mirror building? That's the both buildings are the are the um, are the the labs that that we have, and so oh, that's that, great. That's on campus proper, um, and the new hospital is just off just off campus. Isn't that fantastic? All right, Craig. As usual, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate what you did. We're going to go into some questions right now. I think I have a few. Yes, I have a few here. Um, what is the difference between autologous VMT and allogenic VMT? Second part, is it true to perform an allogenic VMT? Is it prudent to perform an allogenic VMT after failing more than one auto VMT? Such a good question. So an autologous VMT uh, or stem cell transplant is really just a way to deliver chemotherapy safely. And so if you want to deliver high doses of chemotherapy, you get the your stem cells, the cells that will regenerate a brand new bone marrow. You put it away, you, you collect those with shots, um, and, and you put those in a the freezer. Then you can deliver a high dose of chemotherapy that will then cause the blood counts to go really low and to have them recover quickly, you get those frozen stem cells and infuse them back in so that patients recover from that high dose uh, chemotherapy very quickly. So that is an autologous stem cell, stem cell transplant. Again, a way to deliver high dose chemotherapy. An allogeneic transplant is when you get uh, stem cells from a donor. So a related donor or a matched uh, donor. Um, and what that does, it's a bit different. Yes, it delivers chemotherapy, but what it does is that those, you know, if I got a stem cell transplant from Kelly, so if, if I need a transplant and Kelly donated his bone marrow to me, his bone marrow would wake up in my body and be very, very angry that it's not in such a nice person with nice hair like Kelly. <laughs> and then his cells would go to attack parts of my body, so that's graft versus host, controllable, easily controllable, but what his stem cells be very angry about is it would find my cancer cells and destroy my cancer cells when my own cells weren't able to do that. And that's the power of an allogeneic transplant. And you're absolutely right that sometimes if patients uh, fail um, um, initial uh, uh, multiple lines of therapy, and we want to use one of the stronger immune therapies, that's when we use an autologous stem cell transplant to get those donated T cells to destroy the cancer cells. Thank you, Craig. Uh, here, I'll throw this one out. Is it possible to have liquid biopsies from regular blood or serum to find myeloma markers such as NGS or NGF without, without having bone marrow biopsies. That's where, you know, the I, the IMF um, and a lot of the research that they're supporting, that's exactly where we want to go. We've been doing bone marrow biopsies and doing uh, since 1900 um, uh, for, for multiple myeloma. Since 1900, we've been doing the same test for myeloma. And you can find the fragments of these of the plasma of the mutated plasma cell DNA inside the bloodstream. So I do believe that along with a lot of the other cancers um, that are being studied, the myeloma will eventually get to understanding those mutations by doing liquid biopsies and detecting that mutated uh, uh, DNA inside the bloodstream. 
Right. Uh, do the frozen cell stem cells have myeloma cells in them? Very good question. Nope. So how it works when you, so we don't do direct harvest bone marrows uh, for stem cells anymore. So a long, long time ago, uh, we used to do that. Now what we do is we use the, build, the body as a natural filter to fil filter out the cells. So what you do is that you get um, a, um, a drug called um, a GCSF. It stimulates gra uh, granulocytes or those stem cells those stem cells get stimulated by this drug. They float around your bloodstream, and then you put an IV in each arm and you run the blood through a filter that only filters out the stem cells, only those granulocytes, because the stem cells, the myeloma cells look totally different. That's like comparing apples to uh, hand grenades. I mean, they are totally different. And, this, and the filter is able to distinguish between the two so that when you collect the stem cells, you're only collecting the good guys with none of the bad guys. Plus, when we do those, you know, the time that we do the transplant and collect the stem cells is when the myeloma is at, the, at its lowest point so that you're in a very good partial response where 90% of that protein is gone or in a complete response where there's no protein detected. You know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll end it with this. Uh, there's a doctor in Kenya who's been on several of our calls, and he says, thank you so much, doctors. This was an excellent pr presentation thus far. I look forward to the rest of it. I am a Kenyan biomedical doctor. Very Isn't that something? I like that part about other people seeing what we're all doing, because it's the guide, you know, the guide to it, as it were. Greg, fantastic. Rafat, we're going to get you in next. Deborah, hang tight. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw your welcome to the Q&A. You did a great job so far. Let's go on to our next session, our next segment, please. The next segment, is there a slide for this? <laughs> there we go. Okay, I thought there was a free slide. Meditation and a break. See you guys soon. I'm so relaxed, I almost fell asleep during that 10 minute session. I think everyone should do that once a day. How about how many of you do a 20 minute power nap out there? Sometimes when you go over a certain period of that nap, you go, God, I don't even know what day it is and I don't care about it. But a 20 minute power nap, you wake up feeling like a million bucks. Or in some cases, some people like to take a nap before they have margaritas, but I've never understood the whole concept. <laughs> we are halfway through people, halfway through. And I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Rafat Abinar, another gentleman I say uh, with a lot of respect that I've worked with over the years, such as Craig. These two gentlemen have really helped my overall experience in myeloma and understanding the disease itself to help them out. And Deborah will be doing a nice following up with all of it, dealing with side effects, dealing with the multiple, the, now, all aspects of myeloma side effects. So with that being said, that's what you got to look forward to. Let's take it away, Rafat. You're up. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Kelly, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to, you know, be with all these uh, people who have we really missed. I wish we were in person. And um, I'm so excited to hear, uh, to have heard the talk by Dr. Cole, because I think eventually, Kelly, you have to find a different talk, because I think eventually we will not have relapsed myeloma, we will not have refractory myeloma, we will cure multiple myeloma. It's an exciting time. We can say that bravely today. And I think until we get there in the next couple of years, I'm going to tell you today how I treat relapsed multiple myeloma. So um, the question is, when do you treat uh, relapsed multiple myeloma? You heard from Dr. Cole that, you know, you go by the M protein. It goes away, you're in remission, you're happy, goes back up, you're relapsing. So do we treat then when you have a biochemical relapse? The myeloma protein is going up, the free light chain that is involved is going up, or do you treat that clinical relapse? When you have the CRAB criteria, as Dr. Cole mentioned, the anemia, renal failure, the high calcium, the bone destruction, or when you have an extra majority disease, and there's a pros and cons to each of those. Um, we don't know really, I mean, we can speculate, but you know what, most of the approved clinical trials were done 
in uh, relapse uh, patient with biochemical uh, relapse, not uh, the full CRAB criteria. So you need to take that into an account when you're making a decision. Uh, some observations support better outcome when treating biochemical relapse. Uh, Mayo Clinic uh, trial showed if you treat that biochemical relapse, your time without relapse or death from myeloma is superior, 125 months versus 81 months if you get treated when you have a full-blown relapse myeloma. So the cons, you know, about 25% of patients with biochemical relapse may relapse like and go back to like a mugus, like you heard earlier, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. You just have a small monoclonal protein, very stable. It's not going up and it's not causing you anemia, hypercalcemia, renal failure, or bone disease. However, uh, the uh, pros uh, will say, you know, median times between biochemical relapse and clinical symptoms is more about like five to six months. So maybe you should get it right early on before the patient becomes symptomatic. And the other thing is that with each line of therapy, so you get the first treatment, you get induction, like you know, heard from Dr. Cole, RVD transplant, maintenance, that's the line of therapy. And then you relapse and you get, for example, carfilzomib and uh, rubamid and dex, and then you relapse. That's a second line of therapy. What happened is that with each relapse, with each relapse, the depth of response is uh, shorter and the duration of, uh, I mean, smaller and the duration of response is shorter. So you really, you know, I always tell my fellows in my clinic is that we have to get it right early on. That's where your chance of giving the patient the best results, the longest sort of survival without the disease and the longest survival period. So get it right early on because you may not get it right with subsequent relapses. So why, why does that happen? I mean, what's going on with myeloma? Myeloma is uh, something that we call there's a clonal heterogeneity and there is genomic sort of evolution of myeloma over the times. So you start with few myeloma cells around, and then one of them, you know, uh, will take off in the second relapse. It takes off in the third relapse. So let me tell you clonal heterogeneity in English. It's like, you know, myeloma cells in each patient is like a family of odds and aggressive members. The longer this family sticks around, the odder and the more aggressive it becomes. Family therapy is not going to work. You cannot politically, you know, you cannot be politically correct here. So eradicate them early on, especially if you have this high risk myeloma. So what is high risk, you know, risk of short remission and short survival? Why does it happen? Because the myeloma cells that left behind tend to become more aggressive, resistant to chemotherapy. So that's why we use combination therapy to try to eradicate all members of that myeloma family that left behind in your body. And that's how we're gonna succeed. So combination therapy is going to make a huge difference. So when I see a patient with relapsed disease, I will have to think about the patient carefully and make a decision based on the disease, on the treatment they received before, and uh, the patient's uh, related factor. We'll talk about each of them uh, here um, one at a time. So disease related, you know, how did they relapse? They were they relapsing was, you know, full blown multiple myeloma was a new big plasma cytoma tumor of myeloma cells somewhere in the body. Do they have high risk side genetic? Do they have plasma cell leukemia where the myeloma cells are now floating in the blood? Did they have advanced disease when they were diagnosed? And you make a decision based on these factor, you know, the more aggressive the disease, the more uh, aggressive your treatment should be. And then the regimen, prior regimen, I mean, if somebody had RVD and transplant 10 years ago, why not repeat the same thing? But if somebody had, you know, Revlimid, Velcade, Dex, and transplant a year ago, and now they're relapsing, you're not going to repeat the same thing. So the duration of response, the response to the prior treatment is very important. Side effect 
of the prior treatment is very important. If you have somebody who has, you know, neuropathy or cardiac dysfunction, you have to choose the right drug for that patient. And uh, the depth of duration of prior transplant is important because we can use transplant again. However, if it, the response was only six months, why would you repeat it? But if somebody had the transplant 10 years ago and you don't have any other options, you can consider another transplant because that also can improve their blood counts and they can go on a clinical trials or get a new treatment. So, uh, and the patient related factors, I mean, I think we, you know, the good news is that we can respect the patient's autonomy, desires, and uh, and work with the patients. You know, you have to look also at your patient. Is the patients really getting tired, getting frail, not, you know, have other fact, you know, things that bothering them? Are they transplant eligible or not? What does the patient want? Uh, and also respect costs and socioeconomics that may influence the choice of treatment. So these, uh, you saw, you know, a more elegant slide from Dr. Cole, but these are the currently available antimyeloma agents. You know, we still have the steroids. We kind of like them and hate them. I think steroids for a couple months are good, but forever, they're not good. Uh, conventional chemotherapy, the cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, the, the DPACE, uh, metronomic chemotherapy, giving a pill of cytoxin every day with uh, revlimid or thalidomide may work. And you heard about the emits, the proteasome inhibitor. The HDAC is kind of out of the picture. We're not going to talk about it. For certain population of patients, I'm not going to talk about it, but venetoclax, if they have the translocation 1114, it's very exciting. There are a lot of excitement about the antibodies, as you heard earlier. Uh, Ilutuzumab, you know, yes and no. And then you get the uh, bilantumab. We're going to talk about that. And then the expo inhibitor, selenaxer, it's been used in the relapse refractory setting. So how does your oncologist decide what to do? It's like you're going to the cheesecake factory. You get a booklet of a lot of different uh, options and regimen. And, you know, it's uh, really not easy. Look at the guidelines. This is, we call them the National Cancer Compre uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center Network. And they come up with these guidelines to tell us, you know, what, do you use for relapse refractory multiple myeloma? This is version 21. There's version 22 that I did not upload, but you can see there are a lot of different preferred regimen, other recommended regimen, useful regimen, and it's a lot of different combinations here. It's great news that we have options, but it's bad news because sometimes the doctors may get confused. So it's really important that you discuss the options that are giving to you at relapse and make sure it's good for you and it's going to give you quality life and response uh, of the disease. Mayo Clinic attempt to make it a little easier than the uh, Cheesecake Factory menu. Uh, here, what you can see is on uh, patients when the first relapse on maintenance, if they're fit, you can give them carfilzomib or kyprolis with pomilomide or deratumumab, velcade. Um, you can give them DVD if they have indolent relapse. Uh, if they're not on maintenance, you can use Kyprolis Revlimid or Dera Revlimid or Ninlaro Revlimid. So there are a lot of different options that uh, they're trying to let us know that they're available. This is kind of the list of combination available for subsequent relapse. Uh, and I'm not going to go over it. But the principle is like this. It's really not a simple algorithm of treatment one, then two, then three. You have to leverage the benefit of my, uh, multiple mechanism of action in combination therapy. Remember, myeloma in your body when you relapse is not one kind of my, myeloma. There are multiple different uh, family members that need different treatments. And is this your first relapse? Is this later relapse? Are you refractory? You have relapse on Revlimid, you relapse on Velcade, you relapse on antibodies. That's a different story. And you need different treatment. You need different uh, mechanism of actions. You can't really repeat those drugs um, and get benefit from that. So the other thing is that you heard uh, the pyramids, upside down pyramids. The less myeloma you have, 
the better your outcome uh, is going to be. Getting rid of myeloma is a good thing. Getting minimal residual disease negative status. Does that mean you do a bone marrow biopsy, you do a very sensitive assay, you don't find a single myeloma cells. That is a good regimen. That is going to improve your survival. And so we need to try to incorporate regimen that will help us achieve that. And then obviously, not all patients are created equal. Some are high risk, some are standard risk. And you can tailor your therapy. You can be more aggressive with high risk. You can be less aggressive with standard risk myeloma. And always, always balance efficacy and toxicity. And you know what? I just want you to remember, and I'm sure you're going to hear from our nurse leader, that toxicity and side effect is not a badge of honor. It is a symptoms that need to be managed. And there are a lot of good stuff about managing these things. And she's going to fill you in much better than I would do. And then we need to find a way to overdraw, uh, overcome drug resistant. All right. So let's see some of the um, uh, uh, data. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, you know, it's a huge list of things, but I just want to show you that combination therapy, for example, is better than uh, single agent. Here, this is a trial that was uh, done to look at relapse patients and randomize them to get the daratumumab, the antibody against CD38 was Revelmedex versus a group of patients who got just Revelmed and Dex. So Revelmed Dex is, you know, it was used to be sort of the standard for relapse patients. And this trial showed that no, it's actually not good enough to use Revelmed and Dex. Adding daratumumab does improve your response and your what we call progression-free survival time without relapse of your disease. You can see, I want to be in the 58% group, not the 35% group. I want to live longer, and I want my myeloma to last in remission or response much longer. So I think that trial, the Polex trial, made a case that combination therapy is better than single approach. And it didn't matter, you know, when, you know, you got the treatment at first, you know, early on in the relapse or the re late relapse, the benefit is still in favor of the combination, whether it's an early relapse or late re relapse. All right. So daratumumab is not the only antibody available. Now we have isatuximab, which is CD38 antibody. <laughs> excuse, excuse me. And it's been approved in the relapse setting in combination with another emit, pomelamide or pomelist. And the combination does improve also progression-free survival. So the take-home message from the last couple of slides is that combination therapy is better than uh, doublet therapy, aravimid, valcade, uh, pomelist, and dex. You add in monoclonal antibody, you're going to see better results. Okay. So antibodies are amazingly, um, you know, evolving in front of our eyes. And, you know, so we have now something we call antibody conjugate. So the CD38 antibody, uh, deratumumab and isatuximab are naked antibody. So they bind to the myeloma cells. They find this unique things on the myeloma cells. And then they sort of recruit the immune system to eradicate the cells. Well, you can improve on these uh, antibody by adding a toxic agent, uh, sort of bind it to the antibody. When it attached to the myeloma cells, it, this toxin or bomb goes inside the cells and blow it up. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The other exciting thing is these called uh, T-cell bispecific antibody. And uh, this is like amazing uh, stuff that is going on. And we probably get a drug approved here shortly. But this, what happened is that they bring the immune cells, your T-cells, the immune cells that you have in your body that has been kind of sleeping, not really paying attention to the myeloma, next to the myeloma cells, and these cells will destroy it. And uh, it's amazing. It's a steroid free. You give the antibodies and you see great results. Uh, now they can actually improve on those with these called tri-specific antibodies. And there are clinical trials going on with these uh, agents where you add something we call the co-stimulatory agents. You know, you can make the T-cells 
work even better. So it's a really <coughs> exciting times. So what are the pros and cons of some of these immunotherapeutic agents? This is a complicated table. I'm just going to summarize it for you briefly here. So we have the CAR T cells on the left. We have the bispecific in the middle, and then we have the antibody drug conjugates on the, on the right. And basically, CAR T cells, I'm going to talk about it here in a minute. It's a more complicated process. We have to take your immune cells. We have to collect them from your blood, send them to the company that manufactured these drugs. It takes about four to six weeks, and then bring them back. They're not off the shelf. They're not you know, ready for me when you're relapsing. But the bispecific antibodies and the antibody conjugates will be available in the pharmacy. So I have a patient in my clinic, they're relapsing, they need a treatment, I'm going to give them treatment right now. Uh, so that's the advantage of the bispecific antibody and the antibody conjugate. Um, the CAR T cells is, you know, it's one shot and done. It's a great, you don't have to repeat treatment. You don't have to come to uh, the clinic often, but they can be associated with significant side effect. Two of them, we, you know, that we now familiar with and we can manage. One called oh, cytokine oh. release syndrome. Cytokine release syndrome, it's like a um, septic shock. You know, you get a fever, you drop your blood pressure, you drop your oxygen. There is a good algorithm that can help us manage the patient. But unfortunately, three to four percent of the patient can have severe form that require intensive care unit care. The other one is the neurotoxicity that can be associated with that. And the neurotoxicity is really, you know, um, not very common, but if it can happen, it can be uh scary to the patient. The good news is that most patients will recover from it completely. So let's talk about uh, what target. The target that all of these CAR T cells, bispecific and conjugated antibody like is the BCMA, B cell maturation antigen. It's an amazing target that is present on the surface of myeloma cells. And really this is probably one of the most exciting target that we have discovered. And I think most of the clinical trial was therapy toward BCMA has been very successful uh, because it really, you know, is sort of unique to the plasma cells, is not present on any other cells. So the toxicity is limited to getting rid of the myeloma cells, which is good. Also may suppress the immune system a little bit because you can get rid of the normal plasma cells that make antibody to fight infection. But you can overcome that by giving the patient intravenous immunoglobulin and some, something like that. But BCMA is a great target. Most of the clinical trials have shown great benefit. So let's talk about bilintimab, which is a antibody conjugate. So the conjugate is something called methadotin, which goes inside the myeloma cells once the, the antibody bind to BCMA and that's like destroy it, blow it up. So did it really work? And the answer is yes in phase one. So clinical trials are phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is that you have a new drug. You think it's a great. What you do is you don't know the dose that is safe for patients. So what you do is you start with a small dose and then you go up to the next dose if they tolerated the small dose. If they don't tolerate the next that dose, you can't go. So it's really sort of what we call dose escalation. You go up slowly until you get a you know a, a dose that is not safe. And then once you establish the safe dose, then you test it in phase two study. You say, okay, I'm gonna treat everybody with the same dose and see if it works. And if it works, then you can compare it to something else. We call that phase three study. So clinical trials are phase one, new agent. We don't know how uh, what dose is safe. We test new agent that way. And it's, um, you know, I'm so amazed that, um, you know, that patients do that because they're very brave and they really sort of set the stage for discovery of amazing drugs. Uh, we don't have, we wouldn't have Revlimid and Valcade and uh, Kyprolis and Deratumumab, Isatuximab, if people did not participate in phase one study. So in this phase one study, the response rate was 60%. 
So these patients have failed Revlimid, have failed uh, Velcade or something like that, and monoclonal antibody, and they still responded at 60%. So let's go back. So, um, and then they start doing another trial to look at the, you know, in the phase two study, they established the 2.5 and the 3.4 milligrams. But I think now we're sticking with the 2.5 milligram per kilogram. And in this called the DREAM2 efficacy study, the overall response rate was 30%. And 60% of the patient responding had a very good partial response. That means they got rid of 90% of uh, their myeloma. So what is the... Uh, toxicity of this drug, and uh, I, I'm sure some of you on the call may uh, have had this drug, it's really the ocular toxicity, and it's not trivial. Uh, some patients may get, you know, uh, blurred visions, get ulcers on the cornea, and some pain, but the most important thing is that when you get uh, this drug, is that you really have to have an eye exam before each dose, the first dose and subsequent dose. And when you follow the guidelines, you can give this drug uh, safely. And sometimes you one dose can hold you for a long time. I have patients that I give one dose and their myeloma was under control for two to three months. So it is very important that you do this drug in the setting of really close eye monitoring, all right? Um, this is talking about the mechanism of toxicity, uh, you know, it's still being explored, but really it does damage the cornea, the outside layer of the eye. Um, so, uh, the other thing we need to, I, I want to talk to you about the CAR T cells. Basically, as I told you, we take your immune cells, we send it for manufacturing. Once it's ready, we give it back to you. So what does happen? There are two CAR T cells, uh, and one is called uh, IDEC partition uh, or ABICMA, and we'll talk about that first. So this is a CAR T cell study that show, was looking at dose escalation, 150 million cells, 300 million cells, 450 million cells, and this is the, on the right is the total. And what you can see, is that these are relapse refractory patients. You know, you expect a new drug to give you 30% response rate. The response rate has been ranging from 50 in 150 to 81 in the 450 million cells to an average of 73%. Unheard of to see such a depth of response with these cells. So it's really exciting. And this is just looking at the depth of response based on the dose and things like that. What I want to show you is that in the early analysis, the progression-free survival, that mean how long the myeloma stayed behaving was about nine months. So it's not a home run yet, but there's an improvement also in survival to about 20 months. Uh, that's the mean, you know, so it could be, you know, six to three years or more. Um, so this is in very highly refractory patients, you're getting responses that lasting relatively long and uh, improving the survival. So these are some of the side effects that I mentioned to you about CAR T cells. So there's a cytokine release syndrome, uh, old grade was about 64% and advanced grade was about 5%. The good news is that we really have very good regimen to manage uh, the cytokine release and, and the neurotoxicity. And in a good center, you're going to really be able to manage that. The other CAR T cells, which is already approved, Carviti, uh, it's um, based on the, this kind of uh, campaign called CAR2-1. Uh, so this was the phase one study result. So what did the phase one study look? an overall response rate of almost 100%, 97.9%. Look how many patients get a very good partial response, 95%. How many patients get a stringent complete remission uh, at one year, 
at two years, 83%. So those patients who I did not have anything to, to offer them that will translate to improvement in their survival and, you know, and look, the median duration of response not established, about 21 months, um, and you can get to see that the response is quick in about one month, you can see, see myeloma is going, and you'll get the best response in about two and a half months. So CAR T cells, it's uh, amazing in terms of the depth of response and uh, how quickly it gets rid of myeloma. Um, and again, I mean, they all have the cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity, and we have now guidelines on how to manage them. Okay. Um, so what are the other, other emerging therapies? You know, we talked about the CAR T cells, but there are next generation CAR T cells. Now we are making CAR T cells from donors. So it, that will become off the shelf that will make CAR T cells more exciting because it's available. You don't have to take your T cells, send it out, manufacture it, and then bring it back to you. Because when you relapse and you need a treatment, you need treatment now. I think the exciting thing is really going to change things. It's bispecific. There are several of them, about seven different bispecific. One of them anytime will be approved by the uh, FDA. And then people start looking at different targets because myeloma cells, guess what? They can be mean. They can change you know, their expression. They may not have BCMA on the surface. So now people looking at GPRC5D and FCRH5, different flags on the surface of myeloma cells. So I think it's really exciting. And you heard about the newer generation of immunomodulatory drugs and the celomods. So stay tuned. We, we need to uh, see what happened there. So these are the options. And, and again, I, you know, for the sake of time, I did not go over the different combinations, but there are great options available to you. The good news is that when me and Craig started doing myeloma, we used Revlimid in the relapse setting. Now we use Revlimid up front. And I think that's what's going to happen with, I think, the drugs that works really well. Look, we moved Deratumumab up to as part of the induction treatment. You saw the uh, Griffin study that Dr. Cole mentioned to you. And why not move the CAR T cells up front? Why not move the bispecific up front? Why wait until uh, the patient relapse? And I think by giving more uh, of these agents, you're going to get more patient into complete remission. You're going to get more patient into MRD negative, and you're going to start curing myeloma. Why not? So what is the best uh, therapy of relapse? Is that not all relapse are the same? So you need to make sure that you look at the relapse carefully, design, design the treatment accordingly. Uh, remember that combination therapy is better and the available drugs and the combinations are increasing and the optimal therapy is based on the one you need. Um, and we need to get it right at your first relapse because with subsequent relapse, we may not have the same luxury. So I really think that's very important. And I think that's my last slide. So. Goodness. And Rafat, you got to get out of here pretty soon. Can I throw a couple questions at you? Please. please. All right. Uh, testosterone gel, a gentleman here is questioning as it's good for MM patients that, that aren't susceptible to prostate cancer, or is this what does this sound like? I've heard this before. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, testosterone, um, obviously, so most of our patients uh, them are in their 70s. They start having anemia. And the question sometimes, is the anemia related to the treatment or is it related to other factor? Are you iron deficient, B12, folate deficient? thyroid deficient, hypogonadism, low testosterone. So if the patient doesn't have iron deficiency, B12, folate, thyroid deficiency, and their testosterone level is quite low and they're anemic, myeloma under control, it's not caused by the myeloma, then you can consider testosterone to help improve the hemoglobin. Excellent. Now, this question, I'm not sure if it's about treatment. I'll read it out. What do you recommend next 
parentheses, daily dosages at lower levels or higher dosage with longer time off? Yeah, this is a very good question. So um, uh, basically, you know, there are something we call metronomic therapy. And, uh, you know, I, in one of the slides, uh, I mentioned that. And I said, uh, basically, for example, cyclophosphamide. We give cyclophosphamide. This is a chemotherapy. We give it, you know, once a week, six tablets, 10 tablets. And there's data we actually publish on that early on when we use 50 milligram daily with thalidomide when we didn't have any other drugs. And we actually get a 60% response rate. With daily treatment, you get less side effect. You know, it's not like you getting a pulse of big chemotherapy. So it's really sort of, you know, nobody had looked at, you know, big dose versus uh, continuous treatment because it's just, you know, these trials are complicated. Um, it's hard to to do. So it, it really, you know, sometimes I, I go back to it because it's just, you know, who wants to take 12 tablets, you know, at one time, once a week, but some people don't like taking pill every day, you know, so you just discuss that with your patients. And I think both options are, you know, reasonable. Excellent answer. Uh, I'm a last patient who does not show M protein response with the standard test and have been getting and have been getting PET scans quarterly. Does this really indicate how many myeloma cells are present? Huh. That's an interesting question. So I don't understand the question, you know, really well. So you, if you don't have what we call a something to measure your myeloma, so there's no M protein or there's no light chain that is elevated. That's like what Dr. Cole said, non-secretory multiple myeloma. These are rare patients and they are very difficult patient to follow. Quarterly PET scan is a little too much, you know, uh, you know, and quarterly bone marrow is also too too much. You know, nobody would want to do those. If you you know you want to follow the myeloma carefully, if the PET scan was really positive when you started treatment and you repeated that three months and it's negative, I don't think you need to repeat it again for a while until you have any new symptoms or there's any sign, other sign of progression like anemia or high calcium or renal failure. So. I'm not sure a quarterly PET scan is wise. The other thing is that if the way you stated the question, if there's an M protein that has not changed and because it's not changed, we're going to do the PET scan. I just question the wisdom of that. So I, I would try to talk to a myeloma specialist in your area about that. Okay. The final question, are there any adverse effects to COVID vaccinations in myeloma patients? Well, uh, it may be addressed by others uh, later on, but I don't see that there are adverse effect of COVID-19. I encourage it. I actually give it to all of my patients. There's only caveat is that if you're really on immunosuppression with BCMA therapy or with a lot of anti-CD38 antibody like Darcelex or uh, Isatuximab, when you're getting weekly injection or infusion of these drugs, your immune response may not be great. So for these patients, they need to get what we call EvoShield, which is, you know, a man-made antibodies that you get every six months to help you uh, sort of build your immunity. But uh, I encourage a uh, patient to receive COVID-19. I have not seen really any adverse reactions. We've been doing it for, you know, a couple of years now. And uh, most patients who are not severely immunosuppressed, they develop antibody response. And I had patients, you know, um, went through COVID while they on maintenance pyramid. You know, they stopped it during the, the infections and uh, and they resume it after and they did fine. Um, so I think having an immunity is very important. Uh, in the last uh, two months, I'm sure uh, Dr. Cole and uh, have been seeing this. A lot of patients actually getting infected, and they're doing well. They're staying out patients, and they're doing fine because I think they have some immunity. So that's very important. Tough patients that have myeloma and COVID. Gosh, those guys are strong. Yeah. All right, Rafat, you got to get out of here. Uh, Craig, I'd like you to stay for a little bit, of course, and, and we're going to go on to the next segment. Rafat, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. And I appreciate you too.
Ladies and gentlemen, the next one, how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. This is not the one you get your notepad out for because you're gonna see a presentation from someone who's worked with 40 years at the Dana Pharma cancer. That's not true, is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> More Gosh. than 40. I didn't know that. Well, anyway, I've, got, I've known you for about 15 or 20, and I think Deborah Doss does a, a hell of a job presenting here. So, Deb, if you take it off from here, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kelly. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. This part of the program should convey information to help you manage various symptoms of myeloma and also side effects from the treatments in multiple myeloma. Uh, Next slide, please. So the the um, goal of myeloma of treatment for myeloma is always obviously to get disease control, to get your protein as low as possible, but we also want to minimize side effects to allow for good quality of life. Remember that your medical team can't actually, you know, give you suggestions how to minimize side effects or how to uh, manage side effects unless they know about them. Next slide, please. So it's important when you have a visit with your doctor, um, and that includes a telemedicine visit or a visit in their office, that you bring with you a list of all of the symptoms that you've been having for the past month. Along with that, you should always have a list of all current medications that you're on, um, and that includes any medications that are not necessarily for myeloma because you never know the myeloma or the treatments might be affecting chronic other chronic conditions that you have. Also, um, any other concerns that you have. And don't forget to um, ask about your labs and ask either the doctor or the nurse to explain about your labs. Now, telemedicine is rather new to all of us, but in the past year, it's been very perfected. And what we find with uh, telemedicine is you can actually invite a loved one or a relative to come to the visit with you, even if you're in a, another state. Just make sure you let the doctor and nurse know and also the person who's scheduling the appointment. Make sure that they know that you want somebody else to, uh, to be there virtually. Um, I'm not seeing myself. Is my picture up? It is okay. I'm I'm just not seeing it. Um, so this is a very busy slide, but the top row here is the different categories of drugs that we have. And there's about eight categories here. There's actually more than that. And if you go down each row, it will tell you all the drugs that are in each category. The bottom row will tell you the most common side effect that we see with um, each category of drug. By no means is it all the side effects, but just the most common ones. And I'm going to be speaking uh, about some of those side effects right now. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna mention transplant again, although um, Dr. Cole did mention it. Uh, tr the answer as to whether you or not you should get a transplant is not really, is, it's not an easy answer. It's not black and white. Um, it, it, it concerns both you and your family and you know, your preferences and also um, you know, how involved your lifestyle is. The doctor is going to make the decision, as Dr. Cole said, by how you responded to drugs in the past, also um, what your chromosomal analysis might be and data from research. But you should all work together to make that decision. Also, in each transplant center, there is either a transplant coordinator or a research nurse who can give you an hour long educational session about transplant. Um, and that may be helpful in making your decision. The same thing for CAR T cell therapy. Both transplant and CAR T cell are actual processes. They're not just the drug that you take. And they, the process lasts for several weeks. Um, at CAR T cell centers, they also have somebody who can give you an hour long education center so you know uh, what to expect. Both CAR T cell and transplant require you to have a care partner or caretaker who's with you for 24 hours a day for many weeks after the, enti the entire know, process. 
So that's something to take into account uh, uh, when you're considering transplant. Now, we're going to talk about, as I said, uh, symptoms of myeloma and side effects that may be caused by treatments in multiple myeloma. And as Dr. Cole said, the acronym for symptoms of myeloma goes under the acronym CRAB, C-R-A-B. I always add an I to that for infections. Um, I want to tell you about symptoms of a high calcium level can be severe constipation for no reason, stomach aches all the time, also um, slow mentation, difficulty finishing thoughts or sentences. Um, but the most common symptom we see of a high calcium level is when you're sleepy all the time. You know, your spouse may say, you're always falling asleep when I'm talking to you. Of course, this could be for another reason, but um, you might want to call your doctor and get your calcium levels checked. Now, your doctor will always check your calcium when you come in, but if you haven't had an appointment for a while and you're feeling overly sleepy, you might ask to have your calcium checked. And uh, renal, which means kidneys, anemia, bone pain, and infection we're going to talk about in the, uh, uh, in the upcoming slides. Treatments for myeloma, different categories of drugs can cause different side effects. Myelosuppression means a low white count or a low red count, which is anemia. There are um, growth factors that your, your doctor can prescribe. There are injections you take once or twice a week that can help with both uh, low white count and low red count. Both of these things, low white count is called neutropenia, low red count is called anemia. Both can cause a lot of fatigue. Once again, peripheral neuropathy, diarrhea, and infection we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. But I do want to mention deep vein thrombosis. That means clots. And the category of drugs called the IMIDs, and that's your Revlimid, your Pomelis, and your Thalidomide, can um, cause uh, clots to form frequently. That's why your doctor will always put you on an anticoagulant when you're on any of those drugs, either in combination or alone. Anticoagulants can be things like, um, like your Coumadin, Lovenox, Eloquis, or even just aspirin. There are many new anticoagulants also, but please try not to forget to take your anticoagulation every single day. The problem with that with clots is usually they form um, in the legs or arms, but they can travel to the heart or the lungs or even the brain. It is a medical emergency. If you think you have a clot, you want to page your doctor. They will send you to the emergency room. They do a non-invasive test, which is an ultrasound. And if they find that you do have a clot, they'll simply increase your anticoagulation. So I want to tell you about the symptoms of a clot. It's usually a little lump. Most commonly, it's on the leg. It can be the calf, the thigh, or the foot, but it can also be in the arms or even on the neck. The lump may be hot. It may be tender, but it may not be. There also may be no lump. You may just find that it hurts when you walk or your gait has changed. Um, also, any bowel or bladder changes you want to report to your doctor, any numbness or tingling in any of your limbs. Um, all of these things um, can be clots. You want to pay, uh, page your doctor. Bone disease was talked about uh, by Dr. Cole. Um, as he mentioned, most patients are on bone strengthening drugs, um, which help prevent some of the lytic lesions, but unfortunately not all of them. Some of the things that you can do to um, help strengthen your bones is weight bearing activity. And it doesn't have to be strenuous exercise. It can just be walking daily, maybe walking with one pound uh, weights. Um, also, uh, it also, you know, nutrition is very important for uh, bone health. About 40% of patients are diagnosed with some kidney involvement, but all myeloma patients have very fragile kidneys. So the most important thing you can do to protect your kidneys is to drink every day. And I can't stress that enough, drink, 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 between one and two quarts of fluid a day. Fluid, liquid can be anything except, and I'm sorry about this, except liquor. Liquor does not count. 
Um, you can drink coffee, but because coffee is such a strong diuretic and it, it washes the, uh, the liquid out of your body, um, if you drink coffee, you want to drink an extra cup of water for each cup of uh, coffee. Now, the reason that the kidneys are so uh, are, are, are so fragile is that your kidneys are attached to thin tubules that then go into the bladder. And the myeloma protein, that immunoglobulin protein, can easily clog those tubules. So you have to continually um, wash them, uh, wash out that protein. It's um, similar to a toilet. If you don't flush frequently, that toilet paper will pile up and it will clog, uh, clog the pipes. Um, other things you should be very careful about drugs that are metabolized through the kidneys. These are drugs such as your um, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, all of the ibuprofens like Motrin, Aleve, um, um, all of those um, can be hard on the kidneys. Please don't take them without consulting your doctors. Sometimes they'll let you take them uh, once a day, other times they'll tell you not to take them. Also, vancomycin as an antibiotic can be very hard on the kidneys. Uh, if your primary care physician ever, you know, uh, prescribes that, you know, tell, remind them that you have my, uh, myeloma. And you should not be taking contrast dye before you have CAT scans unless your doctor has approved it, because that also can be very hard on the kidneys. This is just stress, drink, drink, drink. I want to talk about steroids for a few minutes. Almost all of our combination therapy involves steroids because the steroids really enhance the effectiveness of the other drugs. But we have found that steroids lose their effectiveness anywhere between six months to a year. So we try to give patients a break from steroids. If you have been stable on your combination uh, therapy for, um, for a long time, you can ask your doctor if you can get a break from the steroids. They're usually the first drug that we uh, stop. So let's talk about some of the side effects. Um, the side effects of the steroids actually are very numerous, probably more than all the other drugs put together. Irritability, mood swings, depression, you can be crying one minute and laughing the next. They can make you manic or hyperactive. Uh, many times they cause, in, cause insomnia. It's okay to ask for a, a sleeping pill. They can cause um, uh, weight gain, skin changes, they can cause increase in sugar levels, which can cause diabetes. Um, also, steroids can cause ulcers and stomach disturbances. So it's very important that you always take steroids with a stomach protectant, like uh, over the counter, you can get Pepsid, Nexium, Prilosec. Uh, also, they should always be taken with food. Most of the time, we recommend that patients take their steroids. And steroids, by the way, are the drugs such as dexamethasone, prednisone, um, methylprednisone, prednisolone. That we suggest the patients take their steroids in the morning with breakfast because hopefully if they're going to be hyper, they'll be active during the day and sleep at night. But some people's body rhythm is different than others. They might metabolize the drug slower. So if you find that you're sleeping all day and awake at night, ask your medical care team if you can try taking the drug uh, with your evening meal. Um, also, as I mentioned, you should be on a stomach protectant anytime you're on steroids and you take them uh, once daily. And steroids can increase the incidence of shingles. So make sure that you've had your shingles vaccine. Remember, the shingles vaccine is two shots a couple months apart. Um, if you can't get the shingles vaccine for some reason, your doctor can prescribe uh, uh, antiviral pills you can take to prevent shingles. If you notice white plaques in your mouth or you're, it's painful to swallow or your mouth is sore, this could be thrush. Once again, your doctor or nurse can pre prescribe something um, to help with that. And I just want to mention some other drugs that also increase the incidence of shingles. And those are uh, drugs, as all of the antibodies can increase the um, incidence of shingles reoccurring. The antibodies, remember, are your sarclissa, your implicity, and your darzalex, and so can Velcade. 
even if you've had the shots against shingles, you still could develop shingles. And shingles usually looks like uh, tiny little blisters, in, maybe in a uh, triangular or circular pattern. But it sometimes the blisters don't show themselves, but you have a lot of uh, pain in a certain area. Once again, it's important to contact your medical care team right away. The sooner you treat, the less painful um, it is. Now, diarrhea can be caused by some of the treatments for myeloma. For instance, long-term use of Revlimid yes, can, cause, can cause diarrhea. Um, Pomelis, by the way, does not cause diarrhea. So you could switch to Pomelis. Also, the GI drugs. I'm not up to code, like bringing in the 110. Also, the the, um, the GI doctors have yeah, mentioned using a drug called Colested, C-O-L-E-S. Yeah, let's, let's see if you can take a look at it and see if it's even more effective. Pardon? Uh, C-O-L-E-S-T-I-D can prevent acute diarrhea. You can also get diarrhea from anything that has magnesium in it, and most of the antibiotics will cause diarrhea, but please don't stop taking the yeah, antibiotics. So have, like, um, just have, you know, ask your doctor for something that will prevent the diarrhea. Milk, thistle, aloe, some of the supplements can also cause um, diarrhea. They usually are over-the-counter medications that can control it. Now, constipation can be caused by some of the supplements like calcium and iron, but the most common cause of constipation is opioids, um, also known as narcotics. Um, you, your nurse should sit down with you and create a bowel regimen. A bowel regimen is a bunch of laxatives that you take daily. You do not want to wait until you're constipated to take the bowel regimen. You want to take it every day to remain regular. There are also new medications that are specifically for opioid-induced constipation that, uh, that you can try to take. And I also have all my patients take a probiotic that can be a quarter cup of yogurt or a probiotic pill, along with a fiber like Benefiber daily. And that really normalizes the gut and can help with both constipation and with diarrhea. Now, peripheral neuropathy is uh, numbness and tingling in the fingers or toes. It can also be um, uh, in the arms or the legs. It can be a sensitivity to touch. It can be a burning sensation on the tops or bottoms of your feet, or it can feel like you're standing in ice water all the time, or cramping going up and down your legs. All of these are peripheral neuropathies. Uh, it, once again, very important. Let your care team, let your medical care team know. They can either change the dosing of the drug that's causing it, or they can uh, reduce the dose. Velcade is the most common drug for causing peripheral neuropathy, but we do sometimes see mild peripheral neuropathy with pomelist or revlimid, also sometimes with kyprolis and some and occasionally with cytoxin. Other things that you can do to decrease peripheral neuropathy is to take a multi-B complex vitamin daily, along with two amino acids twice a day. The amino acids that we have our patients take is acetyl L-carnitine with alpha-lipoic acid, one pill twice daily. And you can usually get that at a health food store or even Walmart and Target have the combination, uh, have the combination pill. There are also um, some drugs that your doctor can uh, prescribe. Those are, those are drugs such as Lyrica, Gabapentin, Cymbalta. These are all drugs that uh, um, affect, uh, that can help with nerve pain. Um, pain, of course, can really affect our quality of life. You don't have to take narcotics for, for pain control. There are many other forms of, of pain control. Some of those drugs that I mentioned are very effective in controlling, especially chronic pain. Um, also, there are many alternative and complementary therapies. You can ask your doctor or nurse to refer you to a pain clinic or a uh, pain uh, a, a pain uh, specialist that they may uh, pain and symptom management specialist they have at many of the clinics and th that can really help with pain but remember pain can also cause depression and anxiety um, and 
and depression and anxiety can cause fatigue, but fatigue can also cause depression and anxiety. Uh, fatigue's the most common complaint that we get with all of our cancer patients. Managing fatigue can be very difficult, but there are things that you can do. One of the things, and it seems like it would do the opposite, is to, uh, it is to exercise. It doesn't have to be vigorous exercise. It can just be taking a walk, getting outside twice a day for half an hour. That really can restore your energy. The same with naps. I know we always think of naps for children, but I believe naps are for anyone over the age of 55. And short naps, they shouldn't be too long, anywhere from 20, minutes, 20 to 45 minutes, once or twice a day also can renew your energy. But, you know, pills for anxiety and depression really can help with fatigue. Uh, I know that's not that that's not what they say they're for, but they really can decrease the um, the feeling of fatigue. They also can help uh, decrease, you know, to decrease pain. We use them a lot for both of these things. And I'm going to end with just um, about infections. Yeah, um, I think this was mentioned before, but you should still be using all the precautions that you used um, for COVID, which is avoiding crowds, wearing masks when you travel, and making sure you wash your hands frequently. And last but not least, these are the pamphlets that the International Myeloma Foundation has. They have handouts for every single one of the symptoms or side effects you might be feeling, as and along with all of the therapies you're getting and each stage of myeloma. And you can order them online through myeloma.org, or you can call 1-800-452-2873. And I thank you for your kind attention, and I would love to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was a great presentation. Um, I just like how you do it as a canvas. You know, it's not, it's paint your life as opposed to get it up there and get it messed up and all that stuff. So I, I think that's a very enjoyable presentation. Let's see, Craig, how often do, after stem cells, do you rec recommend starting maintenance? Revlimed. How often? Um, yeah, is there is there when you're doing a stem cell transplant, I know it's it's for particular people, not just one person. But do you look at it to say that you don't you want to do it six weeks after eight weeks a year? Yeah. So um usually um a two to three months post transplant is kind of a median time to start. Um really we kind of look at the blood counts to see you know, how long um, have they recovered their counts completely and have they recovered from a lot of the symptoms? And so I think I've started it as soon as uh, six weeks um, when someone's counts were, were basically the neutrophil count and their hemoglobin was normal. And we said, why not start? Um, and I think I've waited as long as three months um, okay. where it's just someone just took a little bit longer to recover. But, I guess. But really, it you know the evidence for using maintenance therapy after after transplant um, is is super strong. Um, you know there have been been at least three giant trials that have taken place um, um, actually in the um, in the past what uh, fifteen years that have proven the the worth of. Of, of using maintenance therapy. More recently, there was a study that um, that I mentioned earlier, the, the um, stamina trial, where they actually um, had patients, um, half the patients were allowed to stop their maintenance after three years, and the other group uh, stayed on maintenance. Um, and it was actually kind of half and half. And actually the patients who stopped maintenance early tended to start to relapse early. And so, we still don't know. There's a really interesting trial that's taken place right now um, um, that called the MASTER trial that is using MRD as a measurement to see if we can stop maintenance early on patients. But right now, um, when we start maintenance, usually we leave it on until a patient has their relapse. Okay, I know that was a tough question. I have a tougher one here for Deborah. I am depressed is what they put there. Uh, 
Can you go back to that slide if possible? I missed it. I'd like to talk about it. Um, talk about it. Yeah. Do I have access to the slides? Um, they need they need to put them up. There we go. Let's, let's see. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And right there. <laughs> so can you delve into this a little bit more? Um, yeah, so, you know, especially when you're newly diagnosed, but also throughout the course of your myeloma, there's nothing wrong with taking an antidepressive or anti-anxiety pills. And as I mentioned before, they what they do, what they actually do is focus you so that you're not constantly thinking about your disease or you're not constantly in fear, you know, for your life. They really so that you can focus on other aspects of your life. Um, they really do improve your quality of life. And there's there's no stigma anymore to taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs. I do suggest though that you see a therapist and let them prescribe the one that might be best for you. They actually now have saliva tests where they check your saliva to see which drug um, you you might react to and which one would be best for you, um, which is very, yeah, which is very interesting. But I mean, that's number one where I would start. And those things, they they definitely can help uh, depression and, and they're also getting a therapist. Sometimes just talking to your social worker at your clinic most clinics do have a social worker ask to speak to them weekly that can also help um and there are support groups and things like that but depression affects your whole life it makes your pain worse it you know it it, it affects you emotionally psychologically and physically so it is important that you get you know that you get talk to somebody about it especially try talking to your nurse about it you know and maybe they can make referrals Excellent answer to it. I, I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, what probiotic do you recommend, Deborah? If you recommend, uh, yeah. No. So I so I there's no specific pill that I so that I recommend, but um, the yogurts. You know, you want to you, you want to take some of the. Um, the yogurts, it says they have probiotics uh, within them. Um, I find that if you go to Whole Foods, they usually have somebody who's very uh, knowledgeable there. And you can you can actually ask them, or a health food store, and you can actually ask them what they would recommend either as a yogurt or probiotic. I'm sorry, I don't have a specific one. That's okay. Recommend. Um, oh, and... Have you heard about cocoa butter helping people with peripheral neuropathy? Yes, you know, I'm sorry, that was actually in the slide, and okay. I'm sorry if I didn't mention it. So you use the cocoa butter to massage, and this is, this, I don't think this has been proven, but, you know, you know, they say chocolate gets your endorphins going and you feel better. Well, cocoa butter has some cocoa in it, and so maybe it makes the nerves around your feet feel better. I think it's more the massage that makes them feel better. Oh, but yeah. there are also um, herbal baths, warm herbal baths that can help you feel better, ac that you help your feet with neuropathy, as well as um, acupuncture, some people say works really well for them. So be open to it. Be open yeah. to it. Uh, Dr. Cole, I'll end with this one. Is Daratumavin ever used as a single agent maintenance? So, <laughs> ben. Fantastic. All the questions are fantastic. Um, and that that is a fantastic question. And so um, it can be used as a single agent maintenance. Um, and usually when the the studies that have been done, specifically the um, uh, uh, the Griffin trial, it was combined initially with Ravlimid and then the Daratumumab or the Darafast Pro was then dropped off after a couple of years. Uh, there was a, um, a another study called Cassiopeia, um, which also um, used, is very interesting because it had patients um, start on another um, induction therapy. It wasn't RVD, it was actually uh, Velcade Thalidomide Dex plus, uh, plus uh, Daratumumab. And they started out with not having it, and they were they were randomized to having it, 
subsequently. And and, appear, and patients appear to benefit from having daratumumab anywhere in their induction therapy, either as consolidation and maintenance or up front. And so the million dollar question that we have is, is do is you know moving forward with the with using daratumumab as upfront therapy? Do we need to use it as maintenance therapy? Um, and that's a question that we still need to 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 answer in in clinical trials. But can it be used? It can be used. Is it our preference season? There's not a lot of data to support using it, but again, do I have patients that have been intolerant to other maintenance therapies and we decided to use daratumumab as maintenance? Yes. Fantastic. Well, I, I don't know if you can see my hands, but thank you guys. What a great presentation. I, I, I text for five and he says he's got a glass of champagne he's boarding so he broke the program today ever you're fantastic and craig you have the best slides in the business downright period nothing else you're the you're the master at it so let's take them off screen and we'll go over a couple more things bye guys bye bye so we are thanking you very much for attending today's uh, workshop we have another one coming up in november and it will be our Western one. So some of you that got up or got up this morning and had to get up early, we appreciate that. But remember something, we had some questions here. I want you to remember this. You can access all and any of these slides on our website sometime next week. You can access the slides or just the video or just the audio. So you have many options there. So next slide, please. You know, we couldn't do it without you guys. The Amgen folks, GSK, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen, Cario Farm, Takeda. My goodness, we are so grateful for what you do for my, our programs, and especially this one since I've worked really hard on it. I'm kidding. Really appreciate you've done what you've done for everything. Feedback, people. You know, that's the rules of Kelly Cox and the regional community workshops. Feedback. I want everyone to ask or do something or say something about it. And quite frankly, it's a lot of you out there. So everyone get hustled on that so I can get some answers next week. And I think the next slide is the final slide. And it's blended by spending two hours with us. I hope it was helpful. I hope you got something out of it. We'll see you soon in November. Thank you.